What I'm going to start with is a song. That's how we like to open mornings. That's how we like to open meetings. And it just makes us hopefully feel good about ourselves. Um, the song I'm going to sing is the Okanagan song. And now it's a song that is sung quite often in our territory. Um, so those of you who are from the area probably have heard it, which is a good thing because when I was growing up in high school, I didn't even know the song. Um, it wasn't sung as often as it is today. So we've really come a long way as Okanagan people to have our vo voices heard, to share our, our strength through song, to share our, our appreciation through song. And so that's how I'd like to open this, so or this, this, this morning up. The Okanagan song is a responsibility song. It, it re references that we are Okanagan and we are beautiful, but we are only Okanagan, are we only beautiful because the land is beautiful. So that's a responsibility for us as Okanagan people to maintain this territory so that it can be here for future generations. And that's not just a responsibility for Okanagan people, that's all the people that live and reside within the Okanagan territory to take care of our land, to take care of our water, to take care of our future generations so that they can grow, be strong and be healthy and be proud of who they are no matter where they come from. Um, so I'm going to ask that you rise and stand with me during this song. It's it's not always nice to stand alone, so this helps me out. <clears throat>
twist we, quill we. I mean, stand and sit. The white huskle halt. He squeezed Jordan Coble, couldn't tell us to cut to us knew it. In Tatupa, he squeezed La La. In Tatupa, he squeezed Gaston Louis. He squeezed, he squeezed Barb Coble. In Liu, he squeezed Rick Sagiadin. In Stentima, he squeezed Catherine Louis. Tally limped, Gucci up. Tally limped, Gucci up. Tally huskle halt. Lim limped, Gucci up. He spews. Sinquailton Tally Haska Halt. Uh, so what I just shared with you is a little bit of my language. I'm currently working on becoming a fluent language speaker, and I will be one day. Um, I'll explain the language in a second here. Um, but what I explained is that I'm uh, Jordan Koval, and I come from West Bank. And our language, Takatu Chinuit, translates to Windy Bay. And what Windy Bay means to me um, and it means this to a lot of people in my community. It's not just the fact that the area can be a little windy at times. It's the fact that the winds bring in new people. They bring in new ideas. They bring in change into the community. So I've been here long enough, as young as I am, to see and experience some of these changes. And some of the changes have been amazing. Some of the changes haven't been so easy on us as Okanagan people or as First Nations people or even as new immigrants into the, into the community here. But what I'm experiencing these last few years and this last few, even the last few months is just this beautiful resurgence of pride in culture. And culture in our community is almost a four letter word. It's that thing, you don't want to say culture because people, they don't know what culture is. It's my culture, it's your culture. Whose culture is it? The fact that we can celebrate culture, we can come together and acknowledge that I have a culture, you have a culture, we all have a culture that we live in, and it can be an individual, it could be community, it could be nationhood culture. The fact that we live and we breathe and we eat and we share and we experience life together, that's what culture is. And so that's what I'm happy to experience, having Mayor Colin Bazaran share his experiences, calling me his friend, Islacht. That's, that's prideful, that's something I'm very proud of because it's, it's been a very good experience for me so far in my professional world. Um, I've been able to meet all of Mayor Council both last term and this term for the city of Kelowna. West Bank First Nation will be going through elections this year, dum dum dum, so there'll be new changes happening there. The city of West Kelowna has gone through a few changes and they've grown from a district to a city, so that's something to be proud of as well. So this whole area, this whole central Okanagan, all the way down to the south, all the way up to the north, and everywhere in between is really growing and it's really embracing life, it's embracing culture, it's embracing people coming together and sharing and feeling and experiencing life but also creating a better understanding of who we are, not just as individuals, but as community members, as general community members, not as I live on the reserve and I are 10, you live on city of Kelowna side. It is, we are all in this together. We all have a responsibility for the land. Um, so what you see on the, the writing in the air there, and that's, I didn't just happen to put a picture there and put the writing up there. What I believe and what's been taught to me by some of my elders, specifically Joey Pierre, is that our words travel through the air. They travel with the winds and the, and the breezes that carry those words, and they will land wherever they need to land. So when you speak, speak with a good heart. So I put why huskal halt, which means hello, good day, kulint kwachkich, which means it's good that we've arrived here today. It's, it's also our welcoming, it's also saying, you know, thank you for arriving, but it's good that we've arrived here today together to share this experience, to share these, this future that we have. We're preparing the land for future generations, whether we know it or not, but every day that's the, the life that we walk in. So I come from West Bank. I'm an Okanagan Nation member, a Seal Nation member. Um, our territory is quite large. It's uh, 69,000 square kilometers. It's outlined in that uh, yellow llama looking character. I had a middle school age child come into the museum the other day and said, oh, that looks like an alpaca. So I'm gonna go with alpaca today. It's an alpaca shaped territory that we live in. Uh, but it's a beautiful territory, it's a beautiful land. And it has provided for our people for over 12,000 years on this territory. And that's something to be proud of. It's something that I'm very proud of because we're still here. We weren't supposed to be here. We were supposed to be gone a long time ago through policies, through integration, through assimilation and colonization. We weren't supposed to last but I'm here and I shared my song and I spoke my words 
And I will continue to speak those words for generations to come, hopefully, if the Creator blesses me with a good life. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> hey. I just really want to just really give thanks to all of you for, for attending this conference, for coming into our territory, for sharing in the beauty of our lands. Um, I hope that you not only experience the city of Kelowna, but you come over to the west side of the bridge there. I know the mayor is selling property over here apparently, which is nice, but we also have property on the west side, so feel free to come over there and take a venture. Um, but I just really want to thank the Creative Cities Network for allowing me to come and for inviting me to come and encouraging me to come because it's, you know, as, as was mentioned, I'm, a, I'm type, kind of a busy guy, so I have to be kind of selective with what I'm doing lately. But this is something I felt was very important. This whole network, networking idea, you know, I, when I first started, I was dreading networking with people. I always felt shy and I, you know, I still am shy <laughs> to uh, some extent, but it's really, you know, through the power of the drum, through the power of my language, it's really empowered me to, to come here today. So I really want to thank everyone for inviting me and for allowing me to share a little bit of our history. So West Bank First Nation is part of the Okanagan Nation. We're one of eight member communities that make up this entire alpaca-shaped territory. And it's a beautiful territory, as I mentioned. But there's been a lot of issues over the years. One of the things, one of the, the issues that I face on a daily basis is creating that understanding. People don't understand that we never signed a treaty, we never signed any lease agreement or rental agreement or gave any receipt for the sale of our territory here. It, it, this is unceded territory um, and we're proud of it. But that doesn't mean that we're here to get rid of everyone. That doesn't mean that we're here to take back our territory and get rid of all these people that came and took our stuff. That's not what ownership means to us. That's not what community means to us. It never has been. The original SEAL protocol was that when you're in our territory, you're to behave as an Okanagan. That doesn't mean you're not allowed to come in. That means that when you do come, you learn how to be Okanagan. You share your gifts with us because that's what everyone is. You are all a gift to this community. And so you share a part of that and we share with you and you, we live in a harmonious way and we will continue to grow because that's what the idea of seal means. To be part of the seal nations means you're interwoven with many strands to make one strong whole. And those strands are the people, they're the guests that come into the territory, they're the resources that are provided for us, they're the language and how we connect to our spiritual world. That's what seal means, and so that's what the protocol agreement was. Whether you're invading us and we captured you as slaves because we were strong defenders of our territory, even then, we'd still treat you as equals, we'd still provide you a home, we'd still provide you with that knowledge as to how to live in our territory, and then after you proved yourself to us, you're free to move about the territory, you're free to engage in some relationships with our beautiful people, which is a good thing. You're also free to go home, but most people decided to stay because we do live in a beautiful territory and we are the beautiful people, so they wanted to be part of that community because they're allowed to be, and you're all allowed to be part of our community, but you have to remember to think for generations to come to make sure that those people will be provided for, whether they are your own walks of life or people that you've embraced as your family members or your friends. But this misperception of us as people who take and take and take is not necessarily true. Um, we are a very strong provider for employment on the west side as West Bank First Nation. Uh, we have over 200 employees, only half of which are First Nations or West Bank First Nation in particular, the other half are any other walks of life, so there's diversity within our workplace, um, and there's better appreciation when that happens because people come in and they work for the people because in our, you know, hierarchical structure, we have all the staff and employees, which is me and Tracy over there, we're all down at the very bottom of the barrel, then we have our managers and leadership, our elected officials, but on top of that, we have membership. That's our people, that's who we work for, that's who we serve on a daily basis. And so that's why I have this picture here. Um, it's not just a beautiful beach in any beach in the Okanagan. This is West Bank First Nation's own private beach, which is a very high point of contention um, because we are segregationalists by saying we have our own beach for our own people and no one else is allowed to come there, which isn't exactly true. What that beach represents is, is our strength, is our own, our lasting connection to this territory that we can call our own. It is only a very small section of beach, but we made it beautiful. And it's always been our beach. Prior to it looking like this, we referred to it as the goose beach because that's where the geese came and they 
you know, did their business and then took off and left us with a mess to clean up. So we decided to clean it up so we have something to be proud of and to enjoy. And as soon as we did, everyone else wanted to be on our beach again. And it was like, whoa, weird. You know, we have a beautiful beach. Now everyone wants a piece of it. But this beach is something that's close to us. It's, it's our own way to have a comfortable place for our people to get together, to feel comfortable in their, in their own skin because there is misperception as to how strong and prideful we are, as prideful as we can be, we still need that sense of security for our own people to get together. This is also a beach where we can provide some ceremonies if needed. Um, the, we have a very good uh, School District 23 agreement, the Aboriginal Enhancement Agreement, and part of that agreement was that they created some uh, chief staff, and our uh, Eagle Feather staff, and a unity staff that they carried from our nation all the way to Prince Edward Island and back through each or through a number of communities. I don't want to say each community. There'd be a lot of stops. Um, but they started here, and we started that ceremony at this beach. We dipped those staffs into the water in our territory. Then we brought them over to Prince Edward Island and dipped them in the waters over there in the Atlantic Ocean, then brought them back and collected gifts along the way. So that's why these beaches are important to us. It is a private beach. It is for us. But that's... <laughs> very, very, very small fragment of this territory that was ours at one point in time. So we are very prideful of this territory and we're pr proud to make sure that we keep it clean. The other good thing is that we did build a nice, very beautiful public beach right beside it so everyone can come and enjoy that as well. So we're open. But all of my history, all my culture is based on Chap Tuch. And now this is a little bit difficult for me because my grandmother passed away when I was very young. So I didn't have access to language. I didn't have access to our traditional culture, our cultural practices. So I had to borrow many grandmothers and grandfathers along the way who shared with me their stories, who shared with me chapter, who shared with me language and taught me how to be a proud Okanagan person. And these chapter, they're thousands of years old. They begin well before there was people that walked these territories. They talk about when there was only plants and animals that walked on these lands and they can communicate with each other. And they knew that there's going to be a people that would come to these territories and that we were going to be pitiful. We were going to be naive. We were going to need a lot of help along the way. And so those animals, they provided for us. Those plants, they provided for us. They taught us how to be Okanagan. They taught us how to live, how to sustain ourselves. And it's through the chapter that we continue these practices on. But although these stories are th thousands and thousands of years old, they're very applicable today. One of the stories we share at the museum is a story of Snina, owl woman, who comes in, and traditionally she would come in, and if you weren't watching your children at night, she would come and take your children away. If your children are out wandering in the forest alone, Nina would come and take your children away. If you weren't paying attention to your children, if you weren't paying attention to yourself, if you weren't looking after one another, owl woman would come and take your children away. Snina has transformed herself. We believe in the ability to shapeshift. Snina has transformed herself into things like residential schools, and things like foster care systems, things like assimilation policies, things like drug and alcohol addiction, and the 1,200, over 1,200 missing and murdered women across Canada. That's our woman coming and taking our children away because we're not looking after them. But it's not parents who look after children anymore, and it never has been. It's always been a community that looks after children. I was raised by very, very beautiful and proud women of our community, and I am proud of heck as that. I'm not a very good hunter. I don't fulfill that male stereotypical role in our community where I'm supposed to hunt and be pride and oh, cook, cook meat for me, that's good. No, that's not how I am. I was raised by women, I was raised as a knowledge keeper, so that's what I've become. I become I'm trying to become a storyteller. The question that was asked to me yesterday, do you recognize yourself as an artist or a First Nation artist first? And I said, well, I'm, a, I'm neither. I'm a storyteller and I'm just not even there yet, so I'm not an artist, I'm not a First Nations artist, I'm not a storyteller, I'm just Jordan and I'm just trying to get to where I need to go. Um, I have a long ways to go and all of you will help me to get there, but I will continue to learn from my traditional practices as well. What also has to be mentioned is that coyote, coyote is very important in our stories. Coyote is our main storyteller. He's our main teacher, but he was a very self-absorbed character. He's often driven by his libido as opposed to his well-doings, his good heart. He's often driven by his greed as opposed to his, his willing to help people. Even when he wanted to help people, it was often in a way to show off as opposed to do well. So we have to be mindful of how we learn from Coyote. We have to be mindful of how we can 
conduct ourselves as little coyotes, because uh, that's what we are. We shapeshift throughout our lives. You know, I'm, I'm, I used to say I'm just getting out of my coyote years, but I'm pretty sure I'm out of them now. Um, I, I'm sure I'll have a few setbacks here and there, but it's something that I'm proud of. Um, but it's something we always have to be mindful of. Coyote is a great teacher, um, and he's very important to our people, but he hasn't been always the best teacher for all of us. This image here was taken um, at the Lake Opera, which we staged in 2014 uh, with West Bank First Nation, Turning Point Ensemble from Vancouver, and Astro Lab Music Theater also from Vancouver. And it was a revisiting of the Lake Opera written by Barbara Pentland in 1956, 1954, 1950s, I'll just say 1950s, just to be safe. Um, and that, that was a very beautiful opera. But it wasn't very sympathetic to our culture. It wasn't sympathetic to our people. It referenced the Ogopogo, which in our language is in Haka Eight. I hope you don't have to see in Haka Eight while you're here, because that means the weather's going to change. It's not going to be very good. But in Haka Eight, to us, means the sacred spirit of the lake. So that's what we revisited this opera to do: is to revisit the idea of what Ogopogo and Haka Eight, what that means to us as a people, but also revisit the idea of how First Nations people are represented in things like staged performances, things like media, things like television, and things like what you see on the streets, because that's not always the perfect representation of who we are. But this play was, or this opera was a beautiful experience. It was based on the memoirs of Susan Allison, who was one of the pioneers of this territory, one of the beautiful people that came in and really, truly embraced being Okanagan, truly embraced the idea of in Haka Eight and wanting to learn from our people. So we revisited the opera because the original didn't include First Nations people, so we felt, well, if you're gonna talk about us, we might as well be there. Um, so we incorporated Delphine Derrickson, who's one of my language teachers and grandmothers and everything. She's, she's just a beautiful person. Um, and then on the right there, you see Heather Posey, who was the soprano and played Susan Allison. So we revisited the idea of what happened in that first encounter between Susan Allison and the Okanagan people. And that's exactly what I just shared with you today, song, you know. That's one thing that we can all agree upon, is that music is a form of communication. Opera became a form of communication for us. It was our way to tell us how to be on these lands, how to respect and eight, how to respect ourselves, and how to respect each other. So this opera became a very uh, strong symbol for where I'm at in my life, um, because it was a blending of two worlds. And I've been doing that a lot in my life because I was raised and I was, yes, I was raised on the reserve, but I was, you know, I played soccer, I played basketball, I played a lot of sports. I, I love to get out and be active. Um, I had friends of all ages, of all races and ethnicities and genders, and it wasn't anything that I really thought of as a child as, um, you know, I live on the reserve and I didn't realize, I didn't even acknowledge that I was living in poverty at the time. It was just because we were happy, you know, when we got together. It wasn't like, oh, we're going to get together and eat these measly bits. It was, no, we're getting together, everyone's bringing food, and we are happy people, man. And it was, you know, the mayor mentioned it today, or this morning, we love to celebrate. We always have been celebratory. We've always gotten together. We've never acknowledged that money is our, is our signifier of, of poverty or, or an ill idea of who we are as a culture. When our people get together, we are just the most jovial and beautiful and funny people out there. And it cam comes from Coyote, it comes from these en engagements with other people. And there's been many people that have come into our territory that have celebrated with us. Um, what was mentioned yesterday, and I was really happy to take part in the public art panel discussion, uh, was the banners. And so I, you know, the mayor I said, well, you'll probably see these, and you're going to see them probably all week long. But these banners are something I'm proud of heck as. I was the junior artist, and it has to be mentioned, I was the junior artist in this. Janine Lott is the true, true visionary of these banners. She is the true visionary of art and culture um, for many of our youth today because she, at one point in time, she was the youth counselor, but she was using art as a way of healing for the, for the youth. And so she helped me become an artist, or at least refer to myself as an artist, um, through the work with these banners. I helped her with the coloring of these banners and the digital reproduction of them. But like I said, Janine designed them. And she is a beautiful person. And uh, they, they really represent more than what you just see there. So we have Kilauna. We're in the city of Kelowna. Kelowna comes from our word Kilauna, which translates to grizzly bear. There's many stories as to why this place is called grizzly bear. Um, one story that you probably hear at the Kelowna Museums, which is just down the, high, or just down the road there, and the 
beautiful people there. I encourage you to check them out as well. Um, is the August Juilliard story. It was one of the pioneers that came in and we provided him a pit house and he'd like to go into the, 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 the women's and the children's entrance and crawl in and out. And so he'd crawl in, he'd crawl back out and he'd always look like a grizzly bear because he had his big furry coat on. He had a big bushy beard. So people, the Okanagan people looked at him and said, oh, Keelowna, Keelowna. And so we referred to him as Grizzly Bear and he liked it. And so that name stuck. So it went from New Caledonia to Grizzly Bear or Keelowna or Kelowna. Um, I try to say Keelowna as much as possible because maybe that will stick one day. Um, <laughs> But what we also have with grizzly bear there is some speetlum, which is one of our four food chiefs, which is the bitterroot. We also have the salmon bones in the waters and in the soils. And that's not to say that the salmon are dying. That's to say that the salmon are rejuvenating. They're regenerating themselves. We will have salmon back in our territory uh, sometime soon. Um, and there's also salmon eggs in there floating around. But you also have the beautiful scenery as well. The banner in the middle is our community banner. It does represent us as Okanagan people, embracing one another, securing one another, keeping warm in our blankets. We also have Saskatoon Berry, which is Sia, another one of our four food chiefs, embracing us, caring for us, providing for us. And then across the lake there, we have the Kelowna side, and we're paddling towards there in our traditional dugout canoe. And it's a beautiful relationship that we're forming together. We're walking in both worlds. We're sharing together in our experiences. We're both embracing each other's cultures and languages and ideas of how to belong and be responsible for this territory. So that's what those represent. With the pictographs and the roots of the Saskatoon, the pictographs are the roots of our people. They're our first form of written expression. So that's what they represent for us. Oops, I didn't talk about St. Cleep. And then the St. Cleep banner, the coyote banner there. We have coyote right front and uh, present right in the front there. And we also have three coyotes off in the distance, kind of fooling around, playing, being in different colors because they're shapeshifters. But we also have Mole up in the corner looking after coyote. Mole was coyote's wife, so we snuck her in there to make sure that she's keeping an eye on coyote. Uh, and then we have our four food chiefs banners. Skim Heese, which is black bear, Sia, which is Saskatoon berry, and Titi, which is the salmon, and Speetlum, which is the bitterroot. So those are, those are the banners that we worked on together to really solidify our relationship with the city of Kelowna. Uh, and it's only gotten better since. And so I really want to thank um, Sandra and Pat McCormick, who is not here this morning, but he was here yesterday, and everyone from the city of Kelowna for embracing this project together, for learning with one another, because um, that's what it was for us. It was the first time we've ever gotten together and said, we're going to do this together. And they had some stipulations in the beginning. We had our stipulations in the beginning, and we weren't always seeing eye to eye. But it, did, it only took you know, a conversation. And we said, oh, well, this is, this is how it can work. Well, you want to involve mentorship in your, in your project. Well, the city of Kelowna said, well, we can, we can cater to that. And we said, oh, wow, thank you. Let's move forward. And that was it, you know, that we learned from one another. They understood that mentorship was important to us. We, under, we understand, you know, that policy and relationships are important to them. So there's certain ways of how to do business together, but we can work it out together. We, we know each other's languages. We can all speak English in our community now. Now we're going to start teaching them how to speak Okanagan. And we have, and you'll see that through the Bernard Avenue uh, revitalization tour that we'll do this afternoon. But I'm the curatorial and heritage researcher for West Bank First Nation. I work at the Sensuweeps Heritage Museum, and it's a very beautiful and pride, uh, proud, beautiful place, which I'm very proud to be a part of, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Um, but we've only been open for a year and a bit now, a year and a half, um, so we're very new, but we're very humble, um, but we're very knowledgeable. Uh, our staff is, you know, like Tracy and I, <laughs> our huge staff, but we do have some, some uh, part-time staff that help us out on a regular basis. We are very, very engaged with community, um, not just with West Bank First Nation, but with the outside community as well. Um, creating awareness and appreciation happens when we get together with people. Um, but you can also just come to the museum and I can share some of that information with you. I'm just going to quickly go through or let you read the mission and vision statement for the museum because I believe that it's a beautiful mission and vision statement. And I do have to give credit to Delphine Derrickson and Gail Lyman for really setting the foundation for the museum. Uh, we would not be anywhere without the two of them. Um, and then our manager, Rafta Guevara, who supports us, but also the community members who provided the vision for our museum to even begin. That's where it started was the vision of the community. We have a beautiful gallery space. Uh, permanent gallery space and a rotating exhibit space. The permanent gallery space focuses on Okanagan culture. Uh, the rotating exhibit is, is exactly that, it rotates. So right now it's focused just on the end of our Culture Days exhibition, which was a beautiful exhibition that promotes 
uh, indigenous culture in a contemporary context so that we're not all painted with the same brush so that we are, you know, as much as I love to carry my drum around, that isn't my stereotypical representation. I am wearing some mech's clothing today as opposed to my traditional uh, ribbon shirt, so, you know, I can blend, it's all good. Um, it's important that we acknowledge that our peoples walk in many roads, um, and so we want to support them as best we can, encourage them to be creative, encourage them to express their form of culture, and, and just create awareness that they are practicing traditional culture just in a contemporary form. Creating sculptures is part of our culture. It always has been. Just the fact that you know we have artists that are doing orcs and fairies doesn't mean that you're not doing traditional culture. You're still working with your hands. You're still being creative. You're still tapping into that inter, inner creative creativeness that you have. But our museum, we face a lot of struggles. Um, decolonization, something that we're all going through, something that I'm still going through. Um, like I said, I'm still learning my language. But there's also that idea of being on the West Coast and being a First Nations person on the West, or I shouldn't say the West Coast, the Western side of Canada, because we're not on the coast here. But I say the West Coast because we're often assumed that we have totem poles, we have you know, killer whales, all those types of things that you see, which are beautiful, beautiful representations of the coastal Salish peoples. Well, that's not who we are as Okanagan people. Okanagans, we are, we don't do totem poles, we do carvings, we don't do teepees, we live in, or we would live in pit houses and, and tule mat lean-to structures. But at the same time, <laughs> Delphine herself has lived in many months in teepees, I know how to build a teepee, so this is really difficult to break that stereotype when you're like, yeah, I know how to build a teepee, even though it's not my traditional way of being. But, you know, so there's a lot of struggles that I have uh, personally and professionally that way. Um, but the media hasn't done us any favors over the years. They're, they're getting a little bit better now. You know, those old westerns, they still permeate with me. I still remember cheering for those Indians out back and they would never win. Um, damn you, John Wayne. Um, <laughs> And then also things like the Olympics, you know, it was a very beautiful celebration, provided a lot of opportunity for people. But then it became, oh, it was great that they had all those First Nations dancers. And I'm going, yeah, that was wonderful. But, you know, if you wanted to represent an Okanagan dancer, have Corrine Derrickson out there doing her Okanagan style dance, which is a lot different. Even some of the coastal dances that weren't present there and they're on their territory. I was just going, oh, you're so close yet so far away. Um, so we have a lot of stereotypes to break. Uh, we have, but it's, Difficult, because I don't want to separate us from other First Nations communities. I don't want to say that we're different than them, because we are somewhat different and distinct, but we have a lot of similarities. That beautiful culture, the beautiful way that we express our stories through art and culture is something that we all share. The appreciation for land and, and each other is something that we all share. But we have our own ways of doing that. But we have many tools at our hand. We have self-government in West Bank First Nation. Self-government is extremely important to our people. It, it allows us as Okanagan people, as West Bank First Nation members, to write the laws of these lands, of our reserve lands here. And we only have 814 West Bank First Nation members. We have over 10,000 non-First Nation people, or non-member residents that live on our territory. So that's quite a number of people to make sure that they're being taken care of. We do that through the self-government agreement. We stepped away from the Indian Act. We appropriated some parts of it that work for us, that have worked for First Nations people, but we were able to get rid of that, those pieces that really inhibited our growth and development. We have community vision that led to self-government, led to the museum. We have great management, leadership, and support, um, not just from the community members themselves, but all the way up through the organization and all the way across the Okanagan, I believe, uh, especially for the museum. And we're able to walk in both worlds. We're able to be inclusive. We're able to still welcome new people onto our territory. We're very well recognized. And just a few words to somewhat end my presentation here today. Quill mist, the ability to pull together all aspects of your being, the physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional aspects of your being to move forward with leadership. And that doesn't mean you're an elected official like Councillor Don or Mayor Bazaran here. That means that you're a leader in your community. And we are all leaders. When I was doing our discussion table yesterday, a lot of you mentioned that you're the only person in your department. That means you're the leader of that department. That means that you're the leader of culture in your community. So you have a huge responsibility to make sure that you're being diverse in your representation. You have a huge responsibility that you're being authentic and truthful to yourself and not overworking yourself because that is, that's a byproduct of being in the cultural aspect of, of communities is that you often give more than you're, than you're provided. 
Skelchaut. Skelchaut is our indigenous way of being, our indigenous knowledge, our indigenous systems. And that's what we're implemented into our self-government agreement. Yes, we appropriated a Western style of government, but we also adopted the four food chiefs model as how to move forward with that Western style of government so we can re-indigenize our governance structure. So it's happening, it's taking place. And then pak 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 Tr uh, truly translates to the ability to create spark from a flint, uh, from using flint. So if you think of pak 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 pak, that's what it means. But we, when we're referred to as pak pak, that means that you're intelligent. That means that you're wise. I didn't use the word smart in there because pak pak has always been something that's positive. Fire has always been something that's positive. Yes, it devastates homes and, and territories today, but it represents regeneration in our territory. So when we refer to each other as pak pak, it is the ultimate compliment you can have. So I didn't include the word smart in there because you can be smart in a not, in a not so good way. So pak pak is intelligence, it's wisdom. But that's really all I have to say for today. Um, again, I just truly want to thank you all, Limlimp Kwachkich, for being here, for sharing, and for listening. Uh, thank you for the Creative Cities Network, uh, City of Kelowna, District of West Kelowna, everyone. Thank you, Limlimp. <laughs>